What's up, y'all? Um, trade deadline video part two. Um, Got to talk about the Ben Simmons saga finally coming to an end. Um, at least in Philadelphia, I'm sure it will continue to some degree. In Brooklyn, depending on how that all turns out. Um, but Ben Simmons is a net. James Harden is a 76er. And... Um, you know, a lot of debate about who wins the trade, uh, who loses the trade. And generally, I think, you know, there's a spectrum of opinions on this, but I think, you know, maybe the majority is kind of like, well, this might be a win-win for both sides. Um, especially if we consider James Harden. Now it seems like he never really intended on staying in Brooklyn long term. Um, so yeah, if you can get a guy that you're, you won't have next year, um, from, you know, a multiple all-star, all-defensive player in Ben Simmons. And, you know, an underrated part of this, I think, is uh, Seth Curry being included in the deal. Because um, he's a guy that, you know, you can never have too many of. I feel like, you know, shoots three-pointers at a high level, um, stretches the floor, does some off-ball. You know, can, can kind of usage can vary depending on who's on the floor. You know, a guy who can score 20 points if he has to or a guy that can chip in you know 10 to 12 um when need be so I think you know he's someone that that can help any contending team it can fit in really nicely um especially with Kyrie you know not consistently playing having a guy like Seth Curry in your backcourt uh will help tremendously uh, Andre Drummond similar in terms of uh helping at the center position obviously the free throw thing is a problem come playoff time uh, the same concern is with Ben Simmons as well. It might have to be like an offense-defense situation there in Brooklyn with those two guys. Um, so we'll see. You know, fit. I think I think Brooklyn gets better. You know, even with if Harden, you know, stays the the way he was playing with the injuries, injuries. Um, you know, I think it might be better to kind of balance it out a little bit when you had such a ball-dominant guy in Harden. Obviously, there seemed to be kind of a disagreement in the locker room in terms of scheme. Um, Harden wants to play iso ball, unsurprisingly. Kevin Durant wanted more of, you know, some off-ball movement. Um, and so, you know, Ben Simmons will definitely be more conducive to that. Seth Curry will be more conducive to that kind of style. Um, it kind of boggles my mind just in general. Um, from a basketball standpoint, it seems like everyone can pretty much agree that, you know, off-ball movement um, and an offensive scheme that just, in, you know, requires a little bit more ball movement and off-ball movement seems to be harder to defend. Everyone can kind of agree on that, that it's like, man, I got to keep up with my guy and run through off-ball screens and on-ball screens and pick-and-rolls and pick-and-pops. And if I have to do that every for 24 seconds every possession – you know, uh, you're probably gonna get better shots. And yet, you know, there's a lot of teams that still rely heavily on, you know, isolation basketball. And you know, when you have a guy like Luke or James Harden, it probably turns out pretty well most of the time. But um, if you're trying to develop guys, if you're trying to, you know, incorporate other stars, uh, that doesn't always work. So that's just, just a thought in general. Um, but I think really what's at the core of this trade on both sides is the idea of balancing personalities in a locker room. And I think this is maybe more important in the NBA than any any other sport, just because there's no, you only have 12 guys on a roster, really like eight to nine to 10 really actually matter, really play, really make a difference um, on the floor. And so, you know, the, the voice of the top two or three and, and the chemistry of those guys is like really one of the most important things in terms of trying to win a championship. And you look at the past, you know, pretty much, you could probably look at almost any champion, championship team and almost always their top three guys have bought into some kind of team identity, uh, an unselfishness, um, a togetherness, a commitment to the franchise. Um, you know, you look at all the Warrior teams. Kevin Durant, you know, came on knowing he was joining a team that had already won titles and was not someone who, 
you know, he got his, got his, you know, his buckets and, and whatnot, but through the system, it was not in isolation. It was not like I'm the alpha or anything like that. You know, Clay Thompson and Curry are conducive to that because they can do off ball stuff and run around screens and things like that. Um, and LeBron, I think, in the right situation is someone that always is going to uplift guys and, and try and create some kind of like a championship winning, you know, atmosphere. And that didn't, that's not always the best, especially when they had all those young guys. It can be detrimental. It can set expectations. You know, obviously those guys looked up to him and it, it's a weird dynamic to establish with younger guys. Um, but with more experienced people, you know, LeBron is going to bring uh, that kind of attitude and foster that kind of team, uh, just that team approach to basketball. And, you know, he can obviously become kind of a ball stopper and an ISO guy at times, but I think, you know, his one goal is to win a championship and he understands he can't really do that alone. Um, so when we think about James Harden, who hasn't actually made it to a finals as, you know, the alpha prime he did as on the thunder as a sixth man, um, I don't think that's a coincidence, um, and especially in recent years, you look at Giannis and, and Milwaukee, you know, him, Middleton, and Holiday are all kind of easy going guys, not, you know, guys that demand a lot from a franchise, not really, like, money's not a really concern, they sign long-term extensions with the team, they get along together really well, um, and then, you know, the guys like Bobby Portis and, and George Hill and... Wesley Matthews, like, those are guys that understand their role and are not, you know, locker room problems. Even though Bobby Porter's had a history of it, I think, you know, being in that atmosphere really makes a big difference. Um, when you have a guy like Harden in your locker room, I think it's hard to have that kind of, uh, that commitment from other guys when, you know, you're standing in the corner watching him dribble the, the air out of the ball nine out of every ten possessions. And Philly, obviously, now, so it's the Harden and Embiid show. Um, and we'll see. I mean, they're going to have to figure this out pretty quickly if we're looking at trying to have, you know, make the championship run this season. Um, and, you know, Embiid's not a kind of, like, pick and roll big generally. You know, he's someone that can handle the ball a little bit, um, can post up, can dribble even, you know, he's will pull up from the top of the key and knock down a three too. Like he's not someone who is used to having, you know, a dominant scorer at the point guard position. You play with Ben Simmons, who, you know, was not that kind of archetype himself. So the fit will take some time, I think. And I'm a little worried, um, you know, people were complaining about Tobias Harris making 35 million this year and you know not obviously being an all-star caliber player the guy puts up like 20 and 7 pretty consistently and I think he might suffer the most from this because I don't know he probably won't see the ball uh at all really he's going to be turning into kind of maybe a, a spot up shooter in the corner um the same for Maxi. like I, Maxi has done a great job this year and obviously you know the the Sixers were adamant about not including him in the deal which to me, like, I think I'd rather have Seth Curry paired with James Harden than Maxi, because Maxi was, you know, a guy that could handle the ball. Uh, it, it's hard to see him fit with Harden as kind of like an off-ball guy, as opposed to Curry, who's kind of that's his role and generally what he contributes to a team. Um, so I would have considered, it, you know, Simmons, Maxi, and just keep Curry, keep the first-round picks. Um, I know, obviously. Six are tied to you know, having a young guy in the development process. But you're trying to win a championship right now, and I think Curry helps you do that better than Maxi. Although Maxi, you know, is more exciting, has more potential. You know, you have those first round picks if you're really worried about the future that much. Um, so I'm a little concerned about that, and I'm I'm fine in saying that uh, it's going to be a weird fit to do Harden Maxi. I guess Danny Green. I still. I'm amazed. I was watching the Celtic Sixers game. Um, still amazed Danny Green has managed to, like, fool the NBA into thinking he's, like, good at basketball. I don't understand his, uh, how he's still, like, around and start. Like, he plays a lot. Like, he starts a lot of the time. Um, I just think it's funky. Just funky. A little funky there in Philly. 
Um, and he's probably gonna he's gonna play probably crucial minutes in playoff games, um, and a lot of time probably just be a filler, try and defend some random guy on the other team. Um, so there's that, and you know they lose a little depth there with Drummond um, at the center position. Obviously, you know Daryl Morey has this love affair with Harden. He gave up a ton in order to get him, but he got his guy at the end of the 